Welcome to the Fibromyalgia Podcast with me, Health and Wellness Editor, Verity Clark. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition which goes largely undiagnosed and for which there is currently no cure. Yet in the UK alone, it is estimated that around 1.5 million people are sufferers. Poor diagnosis and zero cure means suffering and silence is a common theme in the chronic pain community. Created in conjunction with the Fibromyalgia magazine, this podcast aims to break this silence because we believe that the more we share, the more ways we will discover for fibromyalgia sufferers to lead happier, healthier lives. We'll be covering and oversharing everything you ever wanted to ask about fibromyalgia, but didn't know who or where to turn to, with conversations with some of the most interesting and thought leading people, both within as well as outside of the fibromyalgia space, to give you information, insight, and inspiration for diagnosing and coping with fibromyalgia. Because even though something is invisible, that doesn't mean it should be kept in the dark. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Anthony Ordman, one of the UK's most experienced and respected specialists in the treatment of pain. He founded and ran the highly respected Chronic Pain Clinic at London's Royal Free Hospital for 20 years and continues in private medical practice. For his contribution to pain medicine, Dr. Aldman was awarded fellowship at the Royal College of Physicians in 2005, and he is now past president of the pain medicine section of the Royal Society of Medicine. Dr. Aldman continues to seek out new ways to help people with long-term pain, and he is now the honorary medical director at Integro Clinics, a private medical cannabis clinic where he works with patients on the use of cannabis-based medicines for pain. Hi, Anthony. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule to talk to me today. How are you doing? Really good. Thank you very much. And thanks for asking me along. Nice to meet you. Absolute pleasure. So we're here today to largely talk about your involvement as a pain specialist in the medical cannabis space. But first of all, I would love to talk to you a bit about fibromyalgia in general from your point of view as a pain specialist. So for people listening that are perhaps new on their journey with chronic pain, can you kind of describe in medical terms what fibromyalgia actually is? Well, fibromyalgia is a relatively common condition where people get widespread pain throughout their body, um, often from the muscles which become painfully tight. but there are, there's a cluster of associated symptoms as well, which people with fibromyalgia often have. Mm-hmm. They talk about brain fog. Yeah. People can't think clearly. They feel a bit sort of um, sedated or, or you know, drowsy. And this may be to do with a, a sleep problem, which so many fibromyalgia people have. Okay. They describe wake, waking every morning with unrefreshing sleep. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? The, well, they wake up feeling maybe more tired than when they went to bed. And the reason for this seems to be that sleep itself appears to be quite disordered mm-hmm. in fibromyalgia. Indeed, that may be part of the cause of fibromyalgia. Um, when we sleep, we go through various stages of sleep several times a night. Uh, we go into deep, deep sleep, yeah. where our muscles are extremely relaxed, and where bursts of growth hormone, which which nourishes and, and treats our muscles, are released from the brain to recondition the muscles. And, and we also go through stages of rapid eye movement sleep, where we're dreaming. And it may be that both of those stages of sleep are deficient in people with fibromyalgia. So they uh, ache when they wake up because mm-hmm. their muscles haven't had a chance to relax and be reconditioned. And their mood and their clarity of thought and their memory are messed up, I would argue, because dreaming is very, very important. Interesting. Memory and sorting out our emotions. And if you can't dream properly, then the next day is not nearly as good as it should be. 
Oh my gosh, I feel like this is a whole new tangent that we could go down with the importance of dreaming. Yeah, dreaming is terribly important. In our electric light society where we all have alarm clocks and rush off to work ridiculously early, some people would argue we don't get that last burst of dreaming that we should have every night. And that's why we're all so edgy and tetchy with each other. But that's another story. (laughs) That is, yeah. So we have sleep. And brain fog is, is one major thing that's associated with fibromyalgia. And then there are several other things. Absolutely. So anxiety and depression and chronic fatigue, as I've mentioned already. And a lot of people with fibromyalgia also have irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. Where they get a lot of gut pain, mm-hmm. and digestive problems, and constipation and diarrhea and so on. A lot of people with fibromyalgia have migraine as well. And a lot of people have TMJ. Oh, what's that? The joint where your jaw joins onto your head. Okay. Temporomandibular joint. A lot of people get pain there as well. Maybe because of tightness in the muscles around the jaw. And then a final finding quite often is of allodynia. That means that light touch on the skin can be felt as being nasty and painful. And that suggests that the pain processing symptoms in the nervous system are not working properly. And that may be another key to what's going on in fibromyalgia. And so then would a patient with fibromyalgia display all of these symptoms or can they be quite singular? I, I think that different people with fibromyalgia have different clusters. Mm-hmm. The, the muscle pain is usually key and uh, people with fibromyalgia usually have several of the other aspects as well. And you said that for you fibromyalgia is something of a specialist interest. Um, why is that particularly? What's fascinating is probably the wrong word, but why do you find what's so intriguing about it for you? Well, I love puzzles. Uh, not that I wish anybody any harm. <laughs> But, you know, I've spent 25 years working in NHS pain clinics and in private pain management practice. And I've always felt so sorry for people with fibromyalgia because not only is it so difficult to find anything that'll help them, and they're having a terrible time with their fibromyalgia, but more than that, so many of the treatments that we try, so many of the medical treatments that we try, I think actually make people worse rather than better. They may add to their brain fog or they may be uh, sedating or or even cause drug dependency, which I think is entirely the wrong thing to do. So I feel sorry for people. It's a challenge to help them. Yeah. And and meeting so many people with fibromyalgia has helped me to get a real feel of the condition and what might be at the root of it. Let's talk a bit about the the root then, because I think um, from people I've been talking to about this, there seems to be kind of a notion that there's not a cause and then there's not a cure. Um, What's your kind of take on that? Because I know you have some interesting theories around um, trauma and patients with fibromyalgia, and I'm wondering whether there's whether whether you have found specific causes that you think could lead to fibromyalgia. Well. Um, a lot of these ideas are still up in the air and therefore some of them are con- controversial but that actually makes it more interesting in a way. I think some families tend to be prone to fibromyalgia so okay. there may be a genetic mm-hmm. predisposition to the condition but still you may need a trigger to set it off. Some people think that there is a disorder of certain aspects of the hormonal system and that Cortisol, which mm-hmm. is one of the stress hormones, is yeah. either long term raise or long term too low. And I think the jury is still out on whether that cortisol system is part of the cause of disordered cortisol system. I feel that most of the patients that I've seen with fibromyalgia, and most of them are women, but mm-hmm. some are men, um, have been through very stressful periods of their lives maybe PTSD from growing up in a war zone, for example, 
it may be that the family has been a very unpleasant place to grow up in, and it's been a difficult childhood for the person, and now they're experiencing the results of that. Um, other people may have been set off by an infection or surgery or something else. So I think it's quite complicated. Yeah. But I think if you sort of get three or four hits, if you like, in some of those causative factors, then you may end up with fibromyalgia. Wow, that's so interesting that your body can manifest pain in that way as a result of something that's happened, perhaps psychologically or, or physically, if it's a kind of a sports injury or something. Well, I think that's something we see with lots of people with pain, that if the feelings about what happened are so strong and so unpleasant that, uh, and maybe the person's been incredibly brave about what's happened, it's easier for them to forget sometimes those feelings or even what's happened. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is, um, the feeling, the emotions then have to come out somewhere and they come out in our body. It's actually easier to tolerate physical pain sometimes than mental pain. So in a way, there's an argument there then that of people looking after their, their mental health and really checking in on themselves and how they are coping with things, even if they're thinking that they're coping fine. It could be. No, they've been incredibly brave. They got on with life mm -hmm. and then something catches up with them many years later. Now, that's a personal view of mine, but I, I do think it's correct and it may not explain fibromyalgia in any, everybody. But I think it's a big part of it. So if that is a part of it, are there then kind of preventative methods that people that may be predisposed to developing it put in place? Well, that's a very interesting question. And I don't know, I can only surmise what the answer <laughs> might be. Surmise away. <laughs> well, it may be that those people who've been through very traumatic experiences or periods in their life need a chance to debrief. And actually, very often the debriefing doesn't need to be with a psychologist or somebody professional. It just needs to be maybe with a good friend mm -hmm. or a kind and understanding family member so that they can just think about these painful episodes in, in a safe environment and process them in their mind rather than coming out in their body as pain. So and just... and can, can that, once somebody has been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, could they then start exploring that route of kind of releasing their pain via talking to people? Yes, yeah, one of the mainstays of treating fibromyalgia in modern NHS pain clinics is cognitive behavioural therapy. Okay. Which is a form of talking mm -hmm. psychology therapy that's uh, very um, well supported these days. Um, so some of my patients I send for psychology. Others just find thinking about all of this too difficult. Mm -hmm. It's not for them. And recently I've been sending those patients to see a colleague of mine who practices yoga therapy. Really? He practices Indian yoga therapy where she tells me that the mind and the body are treated together. Mm -hmm to help the person unburden themselves, not by consciously thinking about what's happened, but just in a more general way. And I think for some people, actually, that's really, really helpful. Um, so I had a young woman uh, quite um, high in the banking sector who worked under incredible strength. That's right, incredible stress. Yes. And she'd also had a very tough time growing up. And she was developing fibromyalgia in front of our eyes. All the muscles were beginning to tighten up. Wow. So this young lady, and she didn't want to be on medicines because she needed all her faculties to do her job. Of course, yeah. I asked her to see a friend of mine who's a psychotherapist and also to see my yoga therapist friend. And six months later, not only was she much, much better in her body, but she said, why do I need this stressful job? I'm not enjoying it. I'm going to do something else. And I thought that was actually quite good all around. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's a real kind of silver lining almost. Yep, yeah, they don't all go as well as that, but that was a good one. So in terms of managing fibromyalgia then, you've been kind of working in the area for, for many, many years and you've seen kind of all different sorts of 
medications recommended and therapies recommended in your kind of personal like medical opinion which ones do you are you mainly advising what what do you see the most benefits with well i think everybody should have the chance of working with a cognitive behavioral therapist and also seeing a physiotherapist who specializes in pain conditions to see what can be achieved there after all there are no side effects usually from those treatments mm-hmm. traditionally in the pain clinic we gave patients medications uh, which we felt calmed the nervous system and they might be amitriptyline uh, which helps people sleep but it's not healthy sleep that's produced and we might give them gabapentin which was a a proper licensed conventional nerve pain medicine I stopped doing that after a while I think they salved the doctor's conscience (laughs) what do you mean? occasionally they helped the patients but usually they took more away from the patient by causing them sedation, right. mm-hmm. worse brain fog, and so on. So I, I've stopped prescribing those. Duloxetine, which is a much more modern antidepressant medicine, can be more useful, in my view, for fibromyalgia. And it's much better tolerated than, say, amitriptyline or gabapentin or pregabalin. So duloxetine can be very useful, but as with all these drugs, if they don't help, we must get the patient off them. Yeah. Because patients can so easily get hooked on these medicines, and then we've done them more harm than good. Yeah, that seems to be the the main kind of concern with somebody that's going to be on long-term medication is the, the side effects that it could have or the addictive qualities. Yes, yes. And so many patients, uh, to use a descriptive term that's quite useful, are turned into zombies, mm-hmm. you know, they're half asleep as they walk around and that's no way to live your life some patients like it because at least they don't feel the mental pain that they're escaping from but it's not a good thing to do to a person no that's a big choice to make isn't it to decide whether to live with pain or to live as a zombie yeah absolutely so i don't do that anymore (laughs) if duloxetine works wonderful if it doesn't i do my best to get them off the duloxetine well, let's... Recently, sorry, carry on. More well, recently, I've been um, getting used to prescribing cannabis-based medicine. Yes, that's what I want to go into. <laughs> all right, for all sorts of long-term pain conditions. And in fact, I've been involved in setting up Integro Medical Clinics, which are a special pain and psychology clinic to help people using cannabis medicines. We still use conventional medical ideas and so on, and sometimes provide, prescribe conventional uh, medications, mm-hmm. if that's appropriate. But more and more, we're using cannabis-based medicines. These are proper pharmaceutical preparations derived from the cannabis plant, but very pure, very, very accurate doses, um, and, and so on, so that we can treat patients using cannabis medicines in a scientific way mm-hmm. and I'm amazed at how many people benefit within okay. a month or so much more than we could ever help them in the ordinary pain clinic and with far less adverse effects we, we aim never to cause adverse effects such as sedation or causing somebody to be high yeah. we think that's not good that's bad practice we <laughs> Um, and we'll readjust the medicine, the blend of the medicine. But so many patients say, oh, um, one patient was a healthcare worker, and after about three weeks, she went back to work with having had fibromyalgia. And she said to me, my colleague said to me, why are you walking normally? No. And she said, oh, gosh, you know, I'm much, much, much better. And also a lot of patients say to me, the funny thing is, I don't seem to have had a migraine attack recently. Wow. So there are kind of incredible scientific proof points then. Yeah. I think there's, uh, you know, we're we're really at the beginning of using cannabis. Mm -hmm. I think think we're going to do a lot of good things with them. It's such a fascinating space. So how did you kind of begin your your journey with cannabis, as you will? Because it it only was legalised in the UK in 2018. But had you been kind of researching it prior to that? Well, 
Yes, as you've already heard, I was terribly dissatisfied with yeah. so many of the standard paid medicines that we were using. But every year when we went to our annual scientific conferences in the British Pain Society and so on, there would be a lecture on the endocannabinoid system. Now, okay. most animals, including us, have, as part of our nervous system, cells whose nerve cells, whose activities are regulated by substances that we make in our bodies, natural substances that are very similar to the cannabis molecules. Right. So that system was called the endocannabinoid system. And every year we would hear how that's going to transform medicine for long-term pain. If only the pharmaceutical industry would adopt these ideas. Mm -hmm. And of course it never happened for a variety of reasons. Um, but with the liberalisation of the regulations, as you said, quite recently, uh, at least we can prescribe these substances now, including THC, yeah. which is the more active of the cannabinoid uh, molecules, along with CBD that many people have bought over the counter. So we can prescribe now the right sort of mixes for people. And so I could put all of this science into action um, in the very safe environment that we provide at Integro Clinics, very safe for the patients because we monitor them, very safe for the doctors because they're always practicing within the regulations. Mm -hmm. And so how does it actually work to benefit people with fibromyalgia? So you're prescribed a cannabis treatment and then how does it kind of work within your body to to relieve the pain? Yeah. Well, what, not, what we tend not to realise is that a lot of the processing of sensory impulses in our nervous system, say, say we pinch our finger or something, the information from that finger goes up the nerves into our spinal cord, mm -hmm. which is uh, in the middle of our spine. And a lot of the processing about that information and deciding whether the finger is safe or it's in danger or whether something's burning it or what it is, a lot of that decision-making processing happens in the spinal cord. Interesting. And in fibromyalgia, yes, it's not all in the brain, and in fibromyalgia, that processing system seems to have gone wrong. It's become unbalanced so that even light touch causes allodynia which we mentioned before, yeah. which feels really horrible and mm -hmm. unpleasant. That's a really good sign the processing system's gone wrong. But the processing system has within it those endocannabinoid substances and receptors for those molecules. And we think that the function of the endocannabinoid system is to rebalance the nervous system when it's got out of balance. And we think that genetically some people don't produce enough endocannabinoid system chemicals. Yeah. So that when their sensory system becomes unbalanced, they can't rebalance it by themselves. It may be a genetic difficulty that they have. But if we replace those or top those substances up with cannabinoids from plants, mm -hmm. phytocannabinoids, we can rebalance the system. And that's what we do. And I think um, because these drugs work a lot in the spinal cord, whereas gabapentin and tricyclics don't really work in the spinal cord, but also because there are fewer um, cannabinoid receptors in the most vital parts of the brain, we can hit the spinal cord centers hard enough without hitting the centers that make you drowsy or whatever. So it's the right drug hitting the right place doing the right thing. And we don't really have those so much in conventional medicine. No, I mean, that seems to make kind of perfect sense, doesn't it? If, so what you're saying is lots of people with chronic pain or and fibromyalgia have an imbalance in their endocannabinoid system. And then we know that cannabis will replace those bits that aren't working. It's kind of a perfect synergy. It seems, it seems strange that it's such a recent phenomenon. Well, cannabis was deliberately given a bad name. You know, cannabis used to be, cannabis medicines used to be very standard medications in conventional medicine, maybe as far as, as the 1960s, when we didn't have many other medicines. 
But where did it go wrong? Noticed. I'm sorry, you're going to you're going to answer my question. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So where did, where did it go wrong in the 1930s? You were saying. Oh, well, you you know all about prohibition of alcohol in yeah. America. And eventually, the prohibition did so much harm, they had to bring alcohol back. <laughs> that left people without, in the anti, you know, in the prohibition offices without anything to do. So they decided to give cannabis a bad name instead, so they could control that and have a job to do. And they called it marijuana, which was a bit of a sort of racial overtones. Yeah. And they tried to stamp it out. And people got very, very spooked about it and it got itself a bad name. Um, whereas somehow morphine, which I think in my view is often worse, is still tolerated, for example. I would argue the same for Gabapent. So I think there was a lot of deliberate uh, spoiling of the name of cannabis. And we're only just beginning to, to right that injustice mm-hmm. for the benefit of our patients. Wow, that's so interesting. It's kind of just come from a societal bias yeah absolutely and then I think the fact that we some of us you're, you're probably too young have lived through the hippie era <laughs> people were deliberately taking far too high doses mm-hmm. to, to have pleasant experiences I, I never did that myself I must say but I think that it's also got, maybe it's a bad name you know and um, um, and that's unfortunate as well but we people like me and you have to do the best we can to find the right role for cannabis medicines to benefit our patients. Yeah, and I mean, it seems like lots of progress is being made fairly quickly. Um, But obviously there's still, people will still be nervous to maybe admit that they are being prescribed it or that it really helps them. What's the kind of key differences between street cannabis and medical cannabis? Well, as I said before, Medical cannabis is pharmaceutical grade. It's much more pure and clean. And we, we know pretty much what's in there and what concentrations are in there. People who buy street cannabis, they may feel they know what they're getting, but often it varies from one, one uh, supplier to another. Secondly, we're using much lower doses mm-hmm. than people who use street cannabis, uh, particularly for recreational reasons. As I said before, we don't ever want to cause unpleasant side effects like sedation or dependency. We aim very hard not to do that. You can't do that with men, with uh, morphine or gabapentin, but you can do it if you, with cannabis medicines. And so, is that is that because you're so careful on the specific doses that you give to each patient? Well, it's partly that. We are very, very careful and we follow our patients up maybe once a week at first. You just, wow, you really? Yeah, you can't do that in an NHS pain clinic. We, our clinic has a practice nurse who's always available and she'll phone people a week after they get the medicine and say, how are you getting on? Wow. Just the patient love and we love it because we feel safe yeah. working in the environment. But presumably that's because there's less patients in the private sector. So if cannabis was to uh, move into, a, into the NHS that kind of care would be harder to give. Yep, it's an advantage of coming to our clinic. (laughs) Um, But but we get the blend right. We we actually give people more CBD than they would get by smoking cannabis. So there's another difference. Um, And sometimes we use oils in which the um, cannabis substances have been dissolved uh, so that you get longer term benefit. Uh, it doesn't always have to be inhaled mm-hmm. by a vaporizer. So you can do it at work without attaching, attracting too much uh, attention. And is it something that you would prescribe somebody long term once they kind of go down this road? Is it something that is sustainable? I feel much happier giving cannabis medicines to somebody long term than morphine or tricyclics or gabapentin because I think they're much safer. There's a sort of joke, but it's true, that the only way you can kill somebody with cannabis medicines is if you drop a ton of it on their head. <laughs> well, the same is not true of morphine or abapentin. So there's a much greater inherent safety with cannabis medicines. God, it's so interesting just to think how, how skewed our views of different medicines yes. are. Um, yes. So you've mentioned that there are 
less side effects but are there for people that might be concerned of side effects have you are there any ones to be aware of well i think when people are just starting the notes if they've never tried cannabis before they might often feel a little dizzy or a little bit high for two or three days but we try not to cause that um we do tell people to be very careful if they're driving but rather they didn't drive mm-hmm. first or brake machines or care for little children you know, or cooking yeah. because it could slow your reflexes a bit but we have to give the same morphines with uh, same warnings yeah. with morphine um, but usually um, occasionally people's appetite is stimulated whether it's because we've removed their pain or whether it does stimulate appetite a bit, so weight gain can be a slight problem. But once we've mentioned it to somebody, they, they watch it mm-hmm. and it comes off again. Um, but on the whole, and, and also we have to be careful, um, the, the cannabis medicines can speed up the breakdown of some other drugs. Okay. And so we warn them that if they're on certain medications, those uh, medication levels could fall in their body. So we just need to monitor that. Things like warfarin and uh, anticonvulsants and so on. So, so, you know, this is proper medical stuff. We yeah. do have to take the same care. Of course, as we yeah. Any other medicine. But that's what we do. That's what we're there for. That's why you get your weekly calls. Um, and is it something that you would prescribe to anybody? with fibromyalgia or are there people that you'd say actually no this is not the best route for you we will always want to make sure that appropriate conventional medical approaches have been tried first that's where that's where i feel we are with cannabis okay so people would maybe come once they kind of they feel that they've reached the the end of their road the end of the road on yeah, various that's routes. how we're doing it at the moment. I think in Canada, more you know, very experienced cannabis doctors are going straight in with cannabis medicine, and I, and I can see the point of that. But we're being very careful here. We're not at all keen for people under eighteen or even under twenty-five to have um, too much THC. Really? Why is that? Because, well, because people's brains are still maturing right up to the age of twenty-five, and we feel that THC can impair that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Now, if they're in dire need, then we will discuss that risk with the person. It doesn't mean we'll never do it. I mean, we had one patient who was suicidal, and we felt the balance of risk was better to go ahead with the cannabis medicine than, uh, uh, but tell them it could affect your brain development slightly, but at least you'll still be alive. I mean, that's frankly how we saw it. Um, so similarly, we we never want to prescribe cannabis medicines for a woman who is either pregnant mm-hmm. or feeding or is about to become pregnant because we don't want to affect the development of the brain of the, the unborn baby yeah. or the baby that's being fed. So, but then that's yes. the same as, as most medication. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, it's a medicine. Yeah, it's a medicine. yeah. What about yeah. changing people's perceptions of it then? How... How do you find it? How do your kind of colleagues react when you said, "Actually, I'm I'm now I'm going down this road. I'm going to specialise in medical cannabis." Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the great pleasures, you know, I, I left the the NHS uh, about three years ago, but I had the great pleasure of treating somebody with oral arthritis in her hands, and she got miraculously better. The hands were no longer painful or inflamed and she was cheerful. I've never seen her properly cheerful before. And then had the enormous um, pleasure of hearing that she'd gone back to her uh, rheumatology clinic to see the rheumatologist who'd been a very good colleague of mine. And the rheumatologist could see for herself how cannabis medicines had transformed the life of her patient. And that's a good way of showing, isn't it? What can be done? Yeah, I mean, so, the, pr- the proof is there. The yeah, proof is there. <laughs> so you're doing good things in helping people understand campus medicines by having webinars and educational um, uh, events, such yeah. as this. Um, but I can I can show doctors that their patients are so much better now with, with no side effects. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm saying 
everybody can be made better with cannabis medicines, just as not every patient can be made better with morphine or gabapentin. But I think we're doing an awful lot of good to people who couldn't be helped in any other way. When you say better, do you mean better quality of life or do you mean a cure? We're not curing people. We're treating their symptoms. Yeah. We say to them, look, at least at first carry on with all your normal medicines from, from your doctors. Don't come off them. And if you're going to come off and discuss it with your specialist, rheumatologist or whoever. But we're drastically reducing the symptoms and therefore we're giving them quality of life back. Right? reducing their pain, they sleep better. My impression is that cannabis medicines will help you sleep. And I think it's normal sleep with those different phases I was telling you about. Deep sleep and dreaming sleep in particular. Ah, and so cannabis can help you get to that stage of sleep? That, now, that's not a fact, but I, I, think it's, I think it's true. And whereas amitriptyline or gabapentin may make you stay asleep, I don't think the sleep is as healthy as normal sleep. But I think the cannabis medicines, if you get it right, do allow you to have normal sleep. And that's part of why fibromyalgia can be improved. Wow, it's, all, it's also interesting. It sounds like you're doing so much great work in this space. Um, before we wrap up, I'd love to know where you see the medical kind of, cannabis space kind of moving in the next... Um, few years do you see it becoming more widely available yes i do the prices of the products are coming down we're using the top grade products and even those prices are coming down um i think there needs to be much more education out there amongst doctors mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to try and do that um uh, by putting on seminars we're putting on a seminar on royal society of medicine in november for, for doctors are very welcome to come. Thank you. And um, so, through that sort of educational work, as as well as just showing how much patient how much patients benefit, I think we're doing what we can. Whether prescribing cannabis medicines will really spill over into the NHS depends on so many non medical things. You know, particularly at the moment, just post COVID. Um, Doctors and nurses just don't have the time to learn this new medicine yeah. and, and to have these serious conversations that you have to have with your patients about the relative risks and blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's no funding for it in the NHS. So we have NICE, the, the institution that evaluates medical products for use in the NHS, not recommending it for the NHS. But that's partly to do with cost and practicality and so on. However, senior people in NICE are publicly saying that doesn't mean they think it's necessarily a bad thing and that it shouldn't be used in non-NHS setups. But it's early days and we're having to monitor everything we do very carefully. And that's what we're doing. It is early days, but it sounds like the patients that are, that are currently using it are, are reaping the benefits from it, from coming to places like Integro. That's right. And, uh, and we're very careful. We have the time to treat people carefully and follow them up. But also, by putting all of these cases on a database, we're beginning to provide the evidence for what cannabis medicines can do to benefit people and show how low the side effect profiles are. I think you're putting forward a fairly solid case for why, why people should be exploring this medicine. Um, finally then, for anybody listening who is interested in maybe try, trying it for themselves, what's the best kind of approach if they're currently only in the, in the NHS system? Well, <laughs> I would say get in touch, you know, Integro Medical Clinics has, has a website and uh, come and see us, even if it's just for a chat, mm -hmm. um, see if it might suit you. Do tell your specialist what they're doing what you're doing. They may be a bit shocked or a bit sort of um, nonplussed, but give them a chance, they're doing the best. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no, I don't mean to be unkind, but come and talk to us and then we've, we will always write to your GP and your specialist to let them know what we're doing and, and discuss any problems with the overlapping of two sorts of treatment with them. 
and uh, you may be pleasantly surprised, you as a patient, and your specialist may be pleasantly surprised. Try it. Well, Anthony, thank you so much. It's been so fascinating. It's such a brilliant subject to be talking about. Thank you so much for your time. A good chat. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. The content on this podcast is for informational purposes only and because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.